Yep, you're right. Hello, everybody. We're Hello. still working on the te technology glitches here. So give us just a minute and Jonathan will be starting. Jonathan, you're muted. So. Um, there's still lights on, so, well, that's up, up to you guys. I don't. Test, test. I can hear you. Perfect. You're going to need to be a little bit louder. Yeah. You need to bring it on Zoom, too. Which screen are you seeing? That looks good. Okay. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. There's like four of us in the room. <laughs> and five online. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Traffic was pretty horrible, I have to say. Well, let's get started. Um, yeah. We're grabbing the other people from the other room. Okay, I um, this is my first meeting as the photo clip coordinator. I think Joel and I kind of tag team the last one. And so uh, this is my inaugural and I, I hope I do all right. Um, uh, I, I did put together a, a, a very brief presentation just to kind of go over a few uh, housekeeping notes, I, I think. And then, uh, and then we'll jump into the pictures. We don't have a whole lot of pictures. It's just uh, Joel, Andy, and I <laughs> are the only ones who have photos. So uh, we have a little bit of time to kind of work through some of this stuff. Okay, let's uh, let me move forward. So whenever I was, um, I asked, I volunteered to, to do the photo club um, and, um, and others asked me to, you know, what, what are your objectives? Uh, what are your goals as the photo club coordinator? And so, I uh, was like, well, I don't know. Uh, let me look at what other photo clubs um, from uh, other chapters of the Audubon Society are doing. Let me steal from them a little bit. Let me put my own um, uh, uh, words in there as well and, and thoughts. And so here's what I've come up with. And so I thought I would just run through this. Um, inspire, educate, and conserve. And so uh, for inspire, uh, we want the uh, photo club to provide an outlet for members to share their photographs of Florida birds, wildlife, and their habitats, to provide a venue for the expression of creativity and the sharing of skills and experiences, and to use photography to promote awareness of wildlife, particularly birds, and their habitat. Uh, to educate, to encourage development and enhancement of visual and technical skills in nature photography uh, for all levels of photographers, to promote ethical behavior in the pursuit of nature photography, and to foster an understanding of the relationship between photographer equipment and post-processing. And lastly, uh, one of the goals is to conserve, to encourage individuals who are passionate about nature photography to use their talent to support nature conservation, to promote capturing images of nature that represent the relationship between wildlife and their environment, and to foster an understanding of photography's ability to inspire others to join in conserving nature. And so, you know, this meeting will certainly be sharing photos. I think sharing photos is, a, you know, it's inspirational. Um, I, I, I get excited about seeing what other folks are doing and where they're, where they're taking their photos. That's kind of my background. I'm not really a biologist. Um, I'm a I'm a lab guy, <laughs> and so uh, uh, so to to come at it from a photography point of view when I take pictures of birds, and so um, you know just to see how other folks what are the birds are you, you are seeing and how we can improve together I think is important. I think that though uh, uh, there, it does provide us an opportunity in a photo club environment where we can uh, focus in on some of these areas, and so I'm looking at a calendar for next year. 
and saying, you know, can we dedicate some of the meetings that we have next year to focus in on some of these areas, such as like post-processing or the use of the, you know, the, the, the technical skills that are associated with photography, or, you know, uh, can we pull together a collection of photographs that tell a story about nature conservation? And so I think that we can, if you have any ideas of like some uh, you know, focused um, uh, themes uh, for, for future meetings for next year, feel free to let me know. Um, I think that this can be a collaborative process and I think we can kind of have a lot of fun with that. Okay. Whenever I, um, I feel like I'm having a lean now. Um, the, um, the uh, uh, whenever last month, Ann asked me to take uh, think about developing rules for a photo contest. Last year, TAS had a, uh, a the fall photo contest. And, and so I was kind of tasked with putting together some rules. And I've done that and I've shared that with Ann and uh, she's gonna take those rules and review them uh, with the board of directors. And so the contest is not yet open, but we do have a photo contest coming down the pike. And um, until then, um, uh, you know, just thinking about the rules, I, I, I needed to think about what is the purpose of a photo contest. And to me, the purpose of a photo contest is first and foremost to increase knowledge and appreciation of Florida's native birds, plants, landscapes, and wildlife, to uh, increase uh, membership in, in the Tampa Audubon Society, and to um, perhaps even increase revenue so that TASC can you know, do other things with uh, well, that we want to do um, as an organization. Uh, so I looked at the rules from last year's photo contest and I kind of copied them. I didn't kind of copy them, I did copy them. Exactly. <laughs> and, <laughs> exactly. And, uh, but I did make some changes as you might expect because last year, um, um, you, uh, you know, just needed to make some changes in order to support those, those purposes that I just laid out. So first is to open it up to the general public. And I know last time we had a discussion about should it or should it not be open to the general public. But if we want to increase task membership, I think that a photo contest is a great way to get people to uh, join the mem uh, join uh, tasks. Um, one way we can kind of spur that on is to charge an entry fee uh, for every photo that is submitted into the contest. This is normal in photo contests. I've got a very nominal here, $10 per image for a non-TAS member, $5 for an image um, for TAS members. And, um, and you know, that, may, that, that price differential may encourage folks to become TAS members in order to um, in, you know, submit photos at a, at a better price. Uh, that, that fee can then support prizes because whenever you, whenever you win a contest, I wanna win a prize. And so uh, I've, I've outlined in the in the rules uh, some modest prizes uh, for the winners uh, for each category. There are different categories um, in the contest. That's the same as last year. And lastly, a notable change is that well, I don't actually don't know how winners were selected in previous years, but um, I, I went ahead and just said, well, winners will be selected by a panel of three judges made up of naturalists and photographers. Um, and then we would announce that in January. And those photographs would be uh, judged in, uh, according to some uh, criteria, which I'm gonna talk about in this. And so we're about to get to the point where Andy can share his photos. <laughs> and, uh, and as a presenter, this is what I want you to do. Tell us who you are, because I don't know who you are, although I do remember Andy from last time. Uh, what is the subject of the photo? If it's, uh, you know, tell us the name of the, of the uh, bird or the uh, plant or, or animal. And uh, what does this story, what does this photo or group of photos tell us? You know, is there a storyline? You know, what inspired you to take this photo? Why did you pick this photo to share with us? And for those online and in the room, if, if you're an observer, you have a job to do as well. And, um, and these are actually the criteria that are in the judging contest, the photo contest. Uh, look at the photo for technical quality. Uh, is, is the composition of the photo clear? Uh, is the subject in focus? Is the, is the photograph properly exposed? Uh, how would you grade the artistic merit of the photo? And how would you grade the originality of the photo? Those are the three criteria uh, that I'm proposing in the photo contest uh, for the judges. Uh, today, you don't, you don't have to share your thoughts. <laughs> Please don't, actually, uh, uh, because 
Uh, that's a photo critique and yes, ma'am. No kidding. I've been going through this whole thing and, the, and it's not showing. No, no we're, 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 you shared the wrong screen. You shared your PowerPoint as a presentation. Thank you. And that's what we were saying. <laughs> well, we can fix that. Yeah. Hold on, folks. We figured out that you're not seeing all of Jonathan's screens. So start the like presentation. Then yeah. yeah. All right. I'll get the tab back to the field. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let me. Uh, do that. Well, let me, I'm not sharing my screen on Zoom, so let me do that first. So let me go to Zoom and share my screen. If you have to have the presentation running, go to share. Yeah. Okay. Let's 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 do that. That. And then that. I'll see if that works. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry about that, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I apologize. No, what does it be okay. So anyhow, uh, one of the things that we can do is talking about critiquing photos. We won't do that in this session, but in the future, if we, we could have one of our sessions where we just talk about photo critiques, where you know we, we bring in some, you bring in some, you know, folks can bring in photos, and then we can have a session about you know, you know what is what works for this photo, what doesn't work for this photo, how can what might you change in the future, so that way we can learn as part of the education part of the uh, goals. So. Uh, 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 but we won't do that today because uh, it's not fair to anybody to do that today. And that's it. That's uh, that's the end of the presentation. <laughs> Let's get to the photos. <laughs> All right. You are getting organized. I'll say that. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, let's see. I want to share. Open that up. Can you see that? You can. Okay. Um. Let's go with uh, uh Andy. Are you okay with going first? Sure. Okay. Am I the only one that lost video? Oh, okay. You guys have video? Yeah. You see? Okay. Uh, Andy, if you're talking, you're going to have to go up and stand that sure. in yeah. laptop for the audio. Sure. And you can okay. use the uh, just hit the arrows. The arrows. Which way do I write to the right? Goes to the next one. Yes, okay, great. All right. So my name is Andy Hamilton. Uh, this is my second meeting. I went to the last one at the Garden Club. Um, I so you know I'm certainly a beginner as a bird watcher. I don't know really any of the technical parts of it. I, I participated last year in the in the birding festival and went to a couple of uh, of those outings. But basically, I like to go out in my canoe and on my bicycle and you know I saw a bunch of interesting stuff so I like to I started to figure out maybe I'd start taking some pictures um, one of the places I like to go on my canoe is Eagle Point Park which is just north of Pasco County I'm mean, just north of uh, Highway 54 on Pasco in Pasco County and uh, you basically you, you go out of a little uh, corridor there and there's an inlet Trouble Creek takes you into another inlet, Philman's Creek, which is not really a creek, but a gulf inlet. And it usually has about four or five feet of water in it. But uh, at low tide, you get breakfast. And this is just a panoramic uh, view from with my, my iPhone. You can see how the sun is coming up and it's hitting. You got, I think you got a baker's dozen of, uh, of birds hit by the sun and a couple in the front that aren't. And I, I just thought it kind of shows the an interesting scene of a huge expanse of very shallow water and then of course this is a mangrove island and on the other side of that is the actual gulf and just to the right of what we see here uh there was a stand of mangroves it's about 60 feet from the island and again this is this is basically sunrise and i guess this is where the the uh these rosette spoonbills there's 17 of them there were roost all night long 
And I, I know you guys are all pros at this, but this is this is really the first time I've seen that many spoonbills anywhere. And it's really, I, usually when I've seen them, they're flying over a highway or you see you see one on a river. And uh, so I just thought that to me it was to me it was fascinating. And you know I'm in a canoe, so I'm quiet, and I I got a a long lens. And so I could get close enough without bothering them. And uh, the interest, uh, and they're uh, they're just fascinating birds to me because of the, just the crazy way they look. But also they have so much expression. You know, this this one right here kind of reminds me of somebody at a bar that maybe thinks he's in on a joke that nobody else <laughs> is in on. And uh, so, I, but you just see all the you see smiles and, and various expressions. And then at about sunrise, they started flying off but they they didn't fly off all at once they'd fly off one at the time and they go over that mangrove island and then they all ended up on the gulf side i guess for the beach view so in a mangrove stand you can see a bunch of things this is of course a uh, juvenile great blue oh okay sure it was showing oh sorry about that so this is a juvenile great blue heron and uh, the thing that I thought was interesting about this is is, is the uh, camouflage uh, you know how well its neck and head uh, even based on the coloration and even the angle how it blends in with with all the mangrove uh, branches and, and they kind of and I'm I'm trying to study photography a little bit and, you know I thought there was kind of some interesting framing there with the with the angles and this guy looks kind of curious to me in one of their weird little expressions. And if I was gonna name this one, I think I'd call it parallel parking, you know, cause they're, they're right there, just, just about exactly the same. And this was just kind of a, a study for me because I, the, the interesting thing is, is when you have one of these long lenses, you see things that you that you don't see right when you're there. I mean, I look at these like the bill looks like it's made out of molded plastic, like those the little dinosaurs that I, that I got from the gas station when I was a kid. And then you've got these eyes that look like strawberries and that the beautiful plumage and then those legs with they have these. These little ruby scales on them and those dark toes that look like they could just kind of grasp anything. They, they look very powerful. And it's just an interesting bird to me. And this one is different from all the other ones because it's got the black coloration over its ear. And then it's got kind of an orange tan around its eyes. So when they all flew over, I could tell I was looking at the same birds because I, I, I don't know whether it's he or she because I don't think there's any dimorphism. Is, is, that, is that the word? Yeah. I don't know what the black is. I've seen that on some too. I was just going to ask her if that is it really? Is it the black thing? I know. It like molting. Molting? Oh, okay. Then yeah. They have that beautiful green head too. That yeah. Green. Yeah. They really. The birds are more prominent green region. Okay. Yeah. Because this was the only one that was colored that way. So is, I wonder if that's a male or a female, you know? Uh, right, that's what I thought. Okay. That, look, that looks like a, a young bird that isn't completely feathered. Ah. In I yet. wonder what the black might mean. Yeah, well, I mean, it just looks to me like it, it hasn't, as you can see, it doesn't have the carmine streak. So it's a first year bird and it's. The who streak? It looks like it's in a molt and just hasn't molted in, grown in all those. We're, we're looking at yeah. The, yeah, the, the breeding birds get a, a carmine bar on their shoulder, a bright, like a carpal bar. Huh. Okay. That's a good picture of the eye, though, the way he's got the, the green around the eye. It's so mm -hmm. nice and clear in this picture. <laughs> the are really shy. Yeah. Whoever just made the comments, I could not hear you. You're unmuted, or you're muted, rather. 
is that came from the speaker on this. Uh, okay. Is sorry, that the one sorry, from? Joel. I I was I'm sitting at my other my laptop here. What I said was that looks to me, well, A, it's a young bird because it doesn't have the deep red streak on the shoulder, the carmine, what they call the carmine drip. So, and it still has some feathers on the head, but it looks to me like it hasn't grown in its cheek feathers yet. So that black that we're looking at is skin. Okay, great. All right. How do we? Oh, there we go. Okay. And this is uh, basically taken in my backyard. I live on a, on a little uh, lake up in North Hillsborough County. Of course, it's a uh, chick, common uh, gallinule, or a, what we used to call them moorhens. And uh, I just thought it was an interesting picture of the parent and the, and the chick and a little lily in the background. And uh, it was interesting to me to see the different kinds of feathers. You've got kind of a lacy or filigree there on the chest, and then you've got a fuzzy on the neck. And it's almost kind of a Velcro-y looking thing on the back and along with the you know, more traditional, what I call more traditional feathers on the wings and the tail. And then you can see you've got the candy corn beak on the parent and uh looks like the uh the beak on the chick is still trying to figure out what it's going to look like but uh so i i just thought that was kind of cool and this is a uh picture that i took last week uh we obviously all just got through uh for us tropical storm ian and uh of course, went, you know, Tuesday we thought it was going to hit us really hard and it turned into a tropical storm for us and of course the people down south uh got a horrific storm but Tuesday night was when it we got the the worst of it at our house and so about 4 30 in the morning my dog and I went out and uh just listened to the wind and at that point the storm was coming back over and uh I saw this and this is to the west. It was two and a half hours before sunrise. And, uh, but it looks like a sun, it looks kind of like a cool uh, sunrise there. And I don't know whether that's the heavy part of the storm going over because the rest of the sky was completely dark. So I took out my phone and held it as still as I could. And, you know, as somebody learning photography, I'm kind of looking maybe for some layers there. And, and I think maybe what you'd call a leading line of the lake going into the, to the middle bright portion of the, uh, of the photo. So it was just, uh, it was just one of those moments where you feel something where, you know, you see the light in the horizon as the storm is passing. So that's what I have. And, and thanks for, thanks for watching. Where are you land yeah. there off the end of 54? Thanks, Andy. Mr. Jackson, you're up. All right. <clears throat> this alligator is at Lettuce Lake Park, and one of the things I've noticed is that people always want to go see the alligators, uh, which is kind of interesting to me. But if you look carefully, this particular alligator is missing a front leg. And apparently he had a battle with something else, but he's a big one. So apparently that didn't slow him down much of anything. So the, the leg is right here or should be right there. Okay, next. Okay, uh, <clears throat> again, Lettuce Lake Park, I had a request from a media that wanted to get some pictures of the park and they wanted to see some typical wildlife. And uh, <clears throat> so I, I, this is a, a male and you oftentimes see them drying their wings, which are a little bit more picturesque, but it's still a nice picture. And I think it definitely shows um, the anhinga. Uh, next. 
and here again we have a knight, a knight, a black heron, black crown knight heron. I think it may be a juvenile. I'm not sure, <clears throat> but they blend in very nicely. And the thing about these things is that you can get good pictures during the daytime because they're half asleep, and they're not going to fly off real quickly as they, as other birds sometimes do, especially the smaller birds. So it's always a real joy to find one uh, right there, just right off the boardwalk. Okay, next. Now, <clears throat> this is not the best picture in the world, but it is through my kitchen window over the sink. And I couldn't resist grabbing my camera and taking this picture. And I was focused on, on this one right here and you can see these are slightly out of focus, but I did catch a lot of drops flying around and uh, they just really love it out there. And uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, these, these are um, house finches, unless mm -hmm. somebody corrects me. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not an expert when it comes to, to birds, but I have two bird baths out there and uh, both of them get well used. And I have three feeders, um, one for suet, I mean, uh, well, uh, one for mealworms, one for suet, one for, for safflower, and one for uh, <clears throat> sunflower. And the sunflower, I have to keep it away from the trees because the, the squirrels will jump on it, but the, the squirrels won't mess with the safflower, so that's that's a lot easier to use. Okay, next one. Again, this is at Lettuce Lake Park, and I just thought it was a kind of a neat picture. And part of it is that you don't see limpkins very often in the water like this. Most of the time they're walking around. I have a lot of them here at, at our pond. And, uh, but this one again is at Lettuce Lake Park, and I like the reflection uh, that it was picking up and it has nice color and so forth. Um, and uh, next one. This is a picture, one of the first pictures I took uh, some years ago off the observation tower at the top. And one of the things that I really learned was that when you're at the top of the observation tower and you're downwind uh, or upwind, I guess I should say, um, they slow down and they're right in front of you. And this particular picture was taken with a very inexpensive lens. Uh, I think I paid $150 for it. It was not, and that was new price, but it does capture uh, a nice picture. And sometimes uh, I go back and I look at my pictures from years ago. I started uh, digital photography in 2004 and some of those pictures are still very good, uh, even though they were taken with, you know, eight megapixel cameras or so forth. But uh, this this camera that I took this picture, I think, was an eight megapixel. Okay, next. And here is another one, uh, and it just grabbed apparently some nest making uh, twigs, and uh, this is again at Lettuce Lake Park off the observation tower. And, uh, but to catch, to catch them in flight with a cheap lens, this was with a cheap lens, uh, is a little bit of a struggle. You can see the blur up here because they're flapping its wings. And that's always a, a situation. You can see the difference between here, which is clear and here, which is not. And that's partly because of the wings and the movement. It's called movement blur. Okay, next one. Limpkins are just a wonderful bird and uh, they're increasingly popular in neighborhoods and goodness, we have hundreds of them in our neighborhood, but this is at Lettuce Lake Park. And <clears throat> I always uh, I always liked when I see them, they have nice white color. One of the challenges in taking a picture of a white bird against a dark background is trying to bring out some of the texture in the feathers in here. Now, I didn't work real hard on this, but normally you can bring this up a little bit so that the uh, the color or at least the, the darkness, I darken it slightly. And at doing so, you can start getting a lot more texture in the feathers. And that's something that 
a lot of photographers really value. Um, and I do too, if I have time to mess with it. Okay, uh, next picture. I found this in my garden. And I go out there often and I saw this thing and I had absolutely no idea what it was. It was a little spooky to me, to be honest with you. It was about an inch and a quarter long. If you look really carefully, it's got some scales here of some sort. It's got a head and it's got these things, these horn-like things. I had no idea. And my wife told me what it was and I said, I don't believe that until I looked it up and sure enough, she was right. Next picture, this is the caterpillar that it makes. And, and this is, this particular picture was taken on a, on a plant that is their host plant or one of their host plants, they have several, um, but it is a, a milkweed type plant. And um, <clears throat> it's a vine, you can see how this is wrapped here. But it, it's interesting in that it has these speckles here and it's a very aggressive eater. See here, it's been chewing away at it. So what is it? Uh, and if if I, and then I, I did a little bit of research, and I was surprised again what it was. Next picture. It's our state, waf, waf, uh, state our state butterfly, the zebra longwing, and it's got um, these stripes here. It's a very attractive, it is the Florida, official Florida butterfly. And uh, and this picture was taken with a cell phone camera. So, you know, you can, you can substitute things and occasionally you get lucky. There's a lot to taking pictures. A lot of times it's a lot like fishing. Uh, if you take enough, you, you come up with a few that aren't too bad. But this picture technically could be better, but I like it because it really shows the type of these are tubular flowers. These flowers are off of a firebush tree. And <clears throat> they're very popular with hummingbirds and butterflies and bees. And it's one of the best all around plants I know. But it is a very nice uh, plant. Now, the thing about this is that I didn't know when I started off that this is what the larva state was earlier than the worm, the caterpillar. And I learned something from this. And I, and I just did this recently, a few weeks ago. So when you go out into your yard, if you have a lot of native plants, you never know what you're gonna find. And I think that's just wonderful. I, I think I may have one more, but I don't think so. No more? Nope, that's it, Rachel. All right. Well, I try not to burden you with a bunch of pictures. So I guess I at least exceeded with that. Okay, well, thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you, wonderful photos, thank you very much. Very educational as well. Okay, I'm up. This is, I have a, like a few photos from Fort DeSoto. Um, um, and then I have some other photos that are my backup photos uh, that are not from Fort DeSoto, but uh, this is a snowy egret taken at the North Beach at Fort DeSoto. You're just snagging little fish. And uh, most of the folks were on the reddish egret and uh, and I decided I would uh, go for the snowy instead. And uh, the snowy, I, you know, it's from, a, from a photography standpoint, I almost think it's a prettier bird. I mean, that's in my opinion, but I, I love the white feathers. Um, I love the, the black legs and, and beak and the yellow lures. And, and, uh, and, 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 and honestly, he has a, just as fascinating uh, feeding behavior as the reddish does, in my opinion. So, uh, here you go. There's that guy. Here he is again. I love the expression on the fish's face. <laughs> the fish. I think that's why I kept that. <laughs> yeah. The comment was on the fish's face. You know, just love that. Love that expression. <laughs> Here is the, uh, uh, the 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 same bird uh, again, showing that same kind of wild wing behavior. You know, as he's running around trying to 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 get get something. And um, and I like the, the diagonal lines it creates uh, with the, the wing up. It kind of mirrors the neck line. Um, I did. There, it was at sunrise, and uh, and I did in post processing kind of bump up that uh, uh, warmth uh, to it uh, because otherwise it was kind of cold uh, with, with the with the blue water. Uh, 
This is uh, an American oyster catcher. Uh, they're pretty common there at the, uh, the, the DeSoto. And um, feeding along the uh, lagoon edge and getting some mollusks there in the, in the water. Water was very calm. And uh, I just, the thing about this photo I really liked is the, uh, the reflection um, in the water. In fact, I could probably crop it in even more and just do this, this area right here. And I think it would uh, work very well. Beautiful bird though, fascinating. And that's an immature. An immature. Mary's just saying that the, the brown on the back indicates that this is an immature bird. I did not know that. Very nice. Uh, on the north end of the North Beach is uh, it's like kind of a hike out there, and uh, there's a whole gaggle of laughing gulls and royal terns and and uh, and other birds. And uh, here's a laughing gull coming in for a landing. And it was a pretty uh, overcast day, and uh, and I thought I would just uh, convert this one to black and white. It really lent itself to it because it wasn't that much color to begin with. It was mostly just kind of white and gray and so uh and i think the black and white conversion kind of helps with uh you know strengthens the the lines uh and the and the the black and the whiteness of it okay so this is not a florida native species <laughs> this is where i'm off the rails a little bit uh, but we don't have any more photos so uh i uh one of the things that that I, I was traveling a lot for work, I've been traveling an incredible amount of in the last four or five weeks. And uh, but I did have a friend come into town one weekend while I was here. And uh, he's like, hey, let's go over to the zoo. And, you know, I was like, well, great. I've never been to the zoo, but let me grab my camera. I'm not into taking photographs of captive birds, but we'll give it a shot and, you know, and see what happens. And so uh, we went to the aviary where they had the, lor the uh, lorikeets, the rainbow lorikeets from Australia. And so uh, it was a challenge. I didn't think it would be such a challenge, but when you have a bunch of people, especially a lot of kids and moms with strollers running around, it was difficult to get into position. And so, uh, and the, the challenge also was how do you make it look like it's not taken at a zoo? Um, you know, not to deceive anybody, but you know, you always want to disclose that, but you know, you just want a nice photograph. And so that was my challenge for the day that I set out to do. Um, and and uh, so here you can see a little bit of the the band on on one of the legs, but otherwise it's uh, uh, I, it looks pretty good I think. Here what here's kind of lens stuff. was it uh, that you were using? What kind of equipment were you using? Yeah, uh, good question, uh, Joel. I'm using a Nikon Z9 uh, is my camera body, and for my lens I'm using a 200 to 500 f 5.6. So 5.6, uh, okay. Yeah. And, and, and in retrospect, you'll see in like this photo, you can see that even though this is at F5.6, you can still see the cage in the background a little bit. There's a little bit of a ghosting of the, of the, of the, of the fence, if you will. Did you have and to use a tripod for that? No, no, all of these are handheld. And, um, and so I think if I had used an aperture a little larger, you know, like F2.8, for example, then this would have would have smoothed out completely. And so that's my lesson. One of my lessons learned is to if I do go back out there and do this again, I mean, this is a great this is a great exercise. You know, it's not difficult to find birds at a zoo, <laughs> but it is, you know, a, an opportunity to polish your technical skills um, really easily with some captive birds. You know, it's I think it's a great place to go practice. And so uh, and, and you might get some great photo photos and as well. Uh, yeah, that's something that I learned was the better lenses, the higher quality lenses, will be a much sharper picture at a lower f-stop than a cheap lens will be. A cheap lens can do okay at higher ones, f8, f, f11, or whatever, but when they get down lower than about 5.6 or 4.5, it, it, uh, it loses a lot of resolution. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, the the you, you pay for what you get when it comes to photography equipment. Um, I picked up the, the lens that I was using was a secondhand lens. Um, I picked it up fairly cheaply, uh, so you don't have to buy brand new um, in order to get the pro level equipment. And so, um, uh, but thanks. Yeah, uh, but I like the, the 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 feather detail in this bird. I was maybe five feet away, 
Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty spectacular, I think. This photograph I don't think works. Um, this is uh, the lorikeet on the ground. He flew down. I'm like, oh, right. This is a great opportunity to get a photograph where I don't have a fence in the background. And um, if I had been in the wild, I would have laid down bell, you know, on, on my belly and to get at eye level to photograph this bird. But I'm in a zoo uh, and there's a bunch of kids and people around and it would have been really, really weird for me to lay down in the middle of the walkway. And so I did not instead I squatted down and I try to get as eye level as I could, but it just doesn't work. I mean, I'm, I'm, you clearly tell that I'm shooting down at the bird. And so, uh, but if I had been at eye level, it would have been uh, better. Here is a, just a little kissy, uh, kissy kiss um, with these birds. Um, I liked it, little behavior. And here is, um, uh, this one I included because Boy, he was just right, and except his head, the, the position of his head, is he's looking up. I say he, I don't know, but he's looking up. And, uh, and so if, if he had just looked at me rather than up in the air, uh, then it would have been a better photograph. And so uh, you always, I think uh, one of the lessons on this one is when possible, you want the bird to look at you. Uh, I think that helps uh, in, in cases, in, in portraits anyway. Another thing uh, I'll tell you is that because he was looking up, there was some shine on the beak. Um, and um, I had to take this one into Photoshop to uh, tone down that shine. Um, pretty simple process, it took a minute, but that is something I did in post-process. This is not a bird. <laughs> this is an orangutan. And, um, you know, uh, the, they were putting on a show out there. And, and I think, uh, one, you know, the point of this photo is, you know, if you can't if you can't uh, uh, exclude the, the 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 enclosure or the the cage or whatever, then then prop in tight. And this is a uh, um, you don't see much of the the external environment just propped in tight right on his face. Uh, the the key here is to get the eyes in focus. Uh, that's with any animal you want to get the eyes in focus. I also in post processing there was I did have to do a little bit of uh, cloning of some some uh, debris in this animal's fur, uh, hair. Um, and so uh, uh, three or four places I did do that to kind of clean it up a little bit. In fact, here is another image. I, th I don't think this is, is the same, the same uh, creature, but you can see that this is the kind of things that I was kind of cloning out. But the babies were active and mamas were active. It was, uh, it was wonderful out there. Here's a family. They're playing, mom and dad are playing, and the little one is just kind of along for the ride. They had boxes out there, so they were having a good time. <laughs> little one was uh, decided to get up on the ropes, and all the mothers uh, out there with their kids were just like, oh my goodness, you know, and that was kind of fun to, to, <laughs> to listen to. Gave me a chuckle, uh, but uh, they're, they're very strong. And um, I have a photo of uh, when I was about three or four years old and I had hair just about like that. <laughs> and uh, another little guy just playing around, uh, just a lot of fun. It was a good practice. You know, sometimes you can't help getting some of the enclosure out of the photograph you're at a zoo. And so you just have to embrace <laughs> what you have and, uh, and just have a little bit of fun with it. Uh, but, but overall, I thought it was, you know, and, 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 this is my last photo. This is of a shoebill native to Africa. Um, this this uh, was shot through a fence, um, but again, I was saying, using that same 200 to 500 pressed up against the fence, and because it's a telephoto lens, it just blurs out the fence. You don't see it at all. Uh, you do see the fence in the background, the wooden fence in the background, but the chain link fence uh, at the front you don't see. Uh, so you can do that. You don't you don't have to be inhibited by the uh, by the fencing. Um, but you know, my, my leaving that, having done that, would I do this again? Probably not, unless I'm just going there to practice with, uh, with, uh, with um, you know, polish up my technical skills. But, you know, I enjoy going to DeSoto, I enjoy going to Circle B and other places, you know, it's just fun to get out into nature and, and, uh, and find what you can. Um, but, uh, you know, for folks who may be limited in their mobility, um, and can't hike out to the north end of North Beach, or they don't have they don't have the means perhaps to go to Australia or Africa. 
this is a great opportunity to go and take some different, you know, if you're just kind of getting tired of doing what you're doing and want to go change the pace up a little bit, go to the zoo. It's a lot of fun. You, you won't be disappointed. Okay, that's what I have. Does anybody have anything, any comments, um, anything you want to say? Well, thank you. I think, okay, well, that's the end of uh, my presentation and the photo club. So, um, congratulations, thank you. Well, thank you. Where were the zoo pictures taken? I'm sorry? The zoo pictures, where were they taken? They were taken at Zoo Tampa. Oh, okay, thank you. They were taken about uh, two or three weeks ago at Zoo Tampa, went on the weekend. And um, I bought an annual pass. And, uh, my first experience there, I'm new to Tampa. I've only been in Tampa for a year. So uh, it was one of those things I had to go do anyway. So uh, it's a very nice suit. They have an, so the lower heat enclosure is very nice. The, uh, they have another aviary. That, I actually took some photos of like uh, scarlet ibis inside the aviary. The challenge with that enclosure is that it's very dark. Um, I was shooting it like ridiculous ISOs and all of those photos are super grainy and and uh, and, and not worth showing <laughs> so uh, so you know uh, it, it's certainly not handheld uh, so uh, uh, great place I enjoyed it okay. well, well Jonathan I just wanted to end here I I really appreciate you taking over I think you're doing a bang up job and if I ever can help you with any advice or anything just let me know Thank you. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. All right, folks. Um, welcome to all of you who are on the uh, on via Zoom. There's there's uh, eight or so of you of us out there. So I am I'm going to put our announcements on. And um, Tammy will be back around 7.30, 7.20 to 7.30 to give the announcements, and then we'll start with the program. So th thanks for participating. Good to see all of you. Pat, Mike, Lynn, good to see you. So uh, next well, month we should be able to make it. And uh, I've got to figure out how to get this set up here for... All right, I need mine. A flash drive. Yeah. 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 Y
we went out to Concord. Here is a uh, sun back and we walked the in. The sun's on that side. You always want the sun for back. The the area was closed. Because this we is all in had met, right. walked so in, walked in from the right on the south side, so we could check yeah. out the, 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 the big the lawns there. Right. When we got up to the, the top of the now fabric in front of the here is the kiosk. So this is the subject. Yeah. Right. That's the only place but that has some damage. He's looking. He's in the back of one of the barns. Some sun is on that side. But other than that, and and he's looking away. Yeah, yeah. That's the way the tracks out. So, um, I've got you know, uh, case our announcements uh, yeah, but on the Zoom. Right. Yeah, but you're right. Can you send me a link? Just send me a link. 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 Okay. Computer turn up. Well, we have some yeah. kind of microphone yeah. first yeah. here. Yeah. What? Uh, well, you know, we've yeah. talked about trying to. Yeah. Well, I'll just okay. to so get speakers. We we thought that we would be able to do it without. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it was just an interesting moment. Exactly. The, yeah. so, but I appreciate it very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes sir. Thanks for help. Yeah, All right. What happens yes, to the cable? Right. Uh, you want us to put up the? Um, yeah, we need to okay. put the. So, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the sun. Oh, the sun. Sun rises. Oh, you know, okay. That's as far as it'll go. Um, just unplug it, and we'll plug it in over here. Yeah, it's 
And the computer. So whichever one would be easier. Well, at this point, it would probably be easier to go. Somebody is trying to get in here. Um, probably be easier just to put a flash drive on this because we have to sign in and get in on the the county um, the the county access Wi-Fi. Wi oh, that yeah, my, it's my county computer. Yeah. So okay, that works though. I was saving the both of them all day long. Great. Well, we're going to let this run because this is just cycling through our announcement. Okay. <laughs>
Disappeared. I 
I just play with a little bit. I chose this rain patch. These rain patches are super turnips. They're folks so we're getting people rearranged here and we will go ahead and start the announcement shortly Thank you. 
Folks, you want to turn around and come on up? We've got people waiting out in Zoom land, so if we can keep things moving. So, uh, good. So, either a down or a, either a down or a right, to the right. will okay. advance them. Okay. So you're handling the Zoom? He's handling the events. Okay. And I should be able to just speak in a regular tone. Okay. So as long as you stay here at the podium. Okay. So I can just start the meeting now. Yeah. And they can hear. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Tampa Audubon meeting, our October meeting. And um, it's been a while since we've all uh, met in person. We had our first in-person meeting in September. This is our second. So we're excited to do that and also to be Zooming tonight. <clears throat> so um, as most of you know, or maybe you don't, since we haven't been in person, we are celebrating our 50th year of Tampa Audubon being incorporated this year. And we've had some um, some special things. Last month, we celebrated with a cake. Um, we have some new merchandise, if anyone's interested in that, that has our 50th anniversary logo, which Erwin created. Erwin's standing in the back here. So <laughs> thank you, Erwin. He's a very talented uh, designer. So. Um, Tampa Audubon was established in the 40s and incorporated as a nonprofit in 1972. It is a chapter of the National Audubon Society and Audubon, Florida, that serves Hillsborough County, the greater Tampa Bay area, its suburbs from Citrus Park to Bayshore, Odessa to Plant City. And our mission is to conserve and restore our ecosystems, focusing on birds, wildlife, their habitats through education, advocacy, community involvement. So we wanna highlight um, our field trips that are coming up. Our field trips are very popular, but we do ask if you have not been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, we ask that until you are, you please do not join our field trips. And pre-registration is required at this time. Um, and we are limiting participation to, uh, to 10 people. So you have to sign up in advance. And uh, please bring your binoculars and a hat and maybe water. So our next field trip is gonna be our um, beginning bird walk at Lettuce Lake Nature Park. Um, it's already full for the Okay, Mary says it's already full. If you want to get on a waiting list, you can um, contact Mary Keith and in case somebody cancels. And our the next field trip will be, the, the first one, I'm sorry, is October 8th, that is full. There's another one on October 13th at 8 a.m. And that again is at Lettuce Lake Park. And that's going to be led by Lillian Saul. 
So uh, Lily, do we still have openings for that one? There's still some openings. So if you can make it uh, on Thursday, October 13th, contact Lillian Saul to pre-register. We also have uh, November field trips coming up. Um, November 12th is a Saturday and we'll have again the beginning bird walk at Lettuce Lake Park. Um, and that one will be led by our president, Ann Paul. And I forgot to say that Ann is, has another engagement tonight, so she can't be with us, but I'm Tammy Lyons, if you haven't met me yet, the, your vice president for Tampa Audubon. Um, and also back to the field trips on Saturday, November 19th, Mick McCarty is gonna lead a trip to Bahia Beach Nature Preserve. That is on Shell Point Road in Ruskin. And um, that's also a great place, a great place to bird and see a lot of ducks, wading birds, bald eagles, and sometimes shorebirds. So we also have the Florida Birding and Nature Festival coming up. It is October 20 through the 23rd at the FWC Youth Conservation Center in Apollo Beach. That's near the Manatee Viewing Center. So that's four days and we have field trips, seminars by experts, two keynote speakers and a free nature expo with 50 booths. So that's a lot of fun um, and it's very popular. Um, so we do, we're always needing volunteers. We have a lot of things going on here with Tampa Audubon. And currently we're looking for uh, people to assist Mary Keith and Mick McCarty and with bird surveys at Schultz Nature Preserve, uh, the Rock Ponds Restoration Project and the Frog Creek Restoration Project. So if you are interested in helping, contact Mary Keith again. And also uh, we could use some volunteers to help maintain the garden at Lettuce Lake Nature Park. Um, with the help of the Suncoast Native Plant Society. And you can contact Tina Patterson. Um, her email is mabelpatterson at hotmail.com. And you can find all this information in our newsletter also or on the web. Um, we also could use more docents at the Joel Jackson Nature Center at Lettuce Lake Nature Park. And uh, Terry Simmons is the one to contact if you want to volunteer. To, to help as a docent at the park. So our ongoing projects that we're always looking for volunteers are Project Colony Watch. You can um, adopt a colony near where you live, develop expertise, learn about water birds, and help monitor these for um, the Audubon of Florida staff. And if you are interested in volunteering for that, contact me, Tammy Lyons, and we will find a um, colony for you that's, that's close to you. Also, we have um, a, a great project that Sandy Reed has started and it's Project Burrow, where we install artificial burrows for burrowing owls. Um, all of our materials are funded by a Tampa Bay Estuary Program's Bay Mini Grant. And Sandy needs people to maintain the burrows that have been put in. And she's also always looking for uh, sites that would be good for burrowing owls. So contact Sandy Reed. I also say there's a lot of information on the Audubon site about burrowing owls what kind of habitat they require and everything else. There's a lot of information on the Camp Audubon website. Okay, I'm, I'm going to. <laughs> yes, and for our Zoomers, Sandy was saying there's a lot of information about uh, burrowing owls, the types of habitat they need, and more information about her project on the Tampa Audubon website, which is tampaaudubon.org. And also we have um, quite a large uh, bluebird uh, monitoring project. Um, to help with that, you can sponsor a box to pay for supplies for our bluebird trails. 
or um, if you want to learn about Bluebird needs, build and install boxes, contact Mary Miller. And um, most of these are uh, the names are like mary.miller at tampaaudubon.org. Um, uh, we have another great project about hooked birds. Um, so we, we've done a wonderful video, Anne and Sandy have worked to develop this great video about the problem with hooked birds. So watch our hooked bird videos on the Tampa Audubon website. Please watch and share the videos with everyone who fishes or goes out in the field so we all know how to safely release ensnared living birds. And that's such a huge problem. And so we want to get the word out about that so people won't be afraid to unhook a, a snared bird. We also want to support the Florida Young Birders Club. If you have a young birder or have, want to help with that, contact um, Jim McGinnity for more information and he can be reached at fybc.tampabay at gmail.com. They also have a Facebook page for information about their outings and how to join. And um, we would like to make everyone aware that avian flu is in our area. It's a viral disease that affects all species of birds and it is confirmed in Hillsborough County. To prevent spread among birds, clean your bird feeders and bird baths each week with a diluted Oh, excuse me, this keeps going ahead of me, with a diluted bleach solution. If you notice sick or dead birds, take your feeders down and bird baths. Do not touch dead birds or sick birds and report them to FWC. And Pasco and Polk counties <clears throat> are putting, are putting, um, invert the, uh, of putting on their ballots, their November ballots, uh, for voters to approve the purchase of environmental lands. Um, ask your friends in both Pasco County and Polk County to vote for their referendum and we can donate to the fund pub publicly. Find out more by visiting pennyforpasco.com and polkforever.com. And uh, we, we definitely want to protect the green swamp the Green Swamp is the headwaters of the Whipple-Coochee, Hillsboro, Alafaya, Little Manatee, Manatee and Peace Rivers, and Florida Scrub Jay Habitats, and key lands for Florida plants and animals. So we know that um, we need to protect those places or they could easily be developed, I'm afraid. And if um, in, um, relation to what we're going to uh, talk about tonight with Ross Dickerson from the county. You can sign up to find out what's happening with our county's environmental lands. Sign up for the Trailblazer. And the email address for that, go to the hillsboroughcounty.org and search for that. And um, our next membership meeting is going to be Thursday, November 3rd at the Tampa Garden Club on Bayshore Boulevard. So remember, we're alternating between um, the site we're at tonight, which is the University of Florida Extension Office, and the Tampa Garden Club on Bayshore Boulevard, both very nice facilities. So um, it will be the photo club meeting at 6, 7 will be our covered dish supper, 17 will be the short business meeting and announcements. And the evening speaker next month will be John Lampkin. And he will be talking about a butterfly's guide to the galaxy or Florida at least. So now I'm going to 